Hey guys, welcome back to another True Crime Thursday. Today I'm going to be talking about the disappearance and probably murder of Evelyn Grace Hartley. This is a case that happened in La Crosse, Wisconsin, going back to my state. Uh, I don't know if it's a great reason to be talking about Wisconsin, but here we are. This case really grinds my gears and I'm gonna share it with you so maybe you can feel the same way I do. Alright, sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Evelyn Grace Hartley was born on November 21st, 1937. She was the youngest of four children. Her family moved to La Crosse, Wisconsin in 1949 from Charleston, Illinois. She was a junior at Central High School with a straight A average and was involved in many school activities, including the Girls Drama Club. She played the piano and sang in the choir at the First Presbyterian Church. She had a few dates with boys, but never had a steady boyfriend. What that has to do with anything, I don't know, but that... there you go. <laughs> On October 24th, 1953, Viggo Rasmussen, a professor at La Crosse State College, now University of Wisconsin La Crosse, hired Evelyn, the daughter of a fellow professor, to take care of his 20-month-year-old daughter. Rasmussen and his wife, along with most of the town, were attending the homecoming game. The family had a regular babysitter, but she also wanted to go to the game, so the Rasmussens went to Evelyn. She brought four or five school books with her so she could study while the baby slept. She was supposed to call at 8.30 p.m. to check in, but she never called. Her father tried several times to get a hold of her, but there was no answer. So, like any rational and awesome parent would, he went straight to the Rasmussens' house. Evelyn's father found the house doors locked and the lights and radio on. The baby was unharmed asleep in her crib, but there was no sign of Evelyn. The furniture inside the living room was disarranged and Evelyn's textbooks were scattered. One of her shoes and her eyeglasses, which were broken, were found in the living room and another one of her shoes was found in the basement. All the windows in the house were locked except one which was a basement window at the back of the house. The screen for that window had been taken out and was leaning up against the outside wall. A short stepladder was positioned at the window in the basement. It belonged to the Rasmussens as they had been using it to paint the basement. Three other windows had pry marks as well. There were footprints from a pair of sneakers in the basement window box and in the living room. In addition to the indications of forced entry, there was a significant amount of blood of Evelyn's blood type, both inside the house and near the basement window, and in the yard. There were pools of blood in the yard. One stain was 18 inches in diameter. There was a bloody handprint about four feet off the ground on a garage 100 feet from the house and stains on the home of the neighbor's house. Authorities believe Evelyn's abductor or abductors carried or dragged her through the yard. The blood pooled twice when the kidnappers stopped and rested her on the ground. So they must have been really weak dudes if they had to do that. I don't know. Or something. Just saying. Tracker dogs traced Evelyn's scent two blocks and then lost the trail at Cooley Drive, northeast of the Rasmussen home. Authorities believe whoever took her put her in a car at this point. One neighbor reported seeing a light-colored car circling the neighborhood at approximately 8 p.m. Another local resident said they heard screams at about 7 p.m., but they assumed it was children playing. I don't know if you guys know what children playing sounds like, but I feel like blood-curling screams sounds a little different than children playing. Just my thought. I I don't know, but uh, that's my thought on it. <laughs> Two days after her disappearance, a local man named Ed Hoffer came forward to say that around 7.15 p.m. that night, he almost hit a two-toned green 1941 or 1942 uh, Buick, which was speeding westward. He noticed two men and a girl inside. One man was driving and the other was in the backseat with a girl who was slumped over. Hoffer said he'd seen the car's occupants a few minutes earlier, staggering down the street near where the blood was found. 
However, had assumed that the three people were headed to the homecoming game, as he was. He didn't realize the significance of what he saw at the time because no one knew Evelyn was missing at this point. Hoffer's information was publicized, but his name was withheld from the media for almost 50 years. Several days after Evelyn's disappearance, a pair of underpants and a brassiere that could have been hers were found near the underpass on Highway 14, two miles south of La Crosse. They were too stained with blood. A blood-stained pair of man's pants were found along the same road four miles away. It is unknown if the pants were related to Evelyn's case. Could have just been another person's blood on pants. A pair of size 11 blood-stained Goodrich sneakers were found in the Coon Valley area southeast of La Crosse. They were apparently dumped there shortly before they were discovered. The soles had a suction cup pattern very similar to the footprints found near where Evelyn was last seen, and the blood was her type. Because back then they couldn't be like, that's her. It was just kind of like, you're type A, she's type A, it's possible. That's kind of all they had. Investigators believe they were worn by her abductor. Inside one of them was a single human hair, possibly from an African American, but... Authorities consulted the Goodrich Company and learned that the particular model of shoe was called the Hood Mogul and was sold in Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, and Illinois. Based on the pattern of wear on the shoes, investigators believed their owner worked with machinery. These shoes also had a distinctive circular wear pattern on the soles, suggesting that their owner frequently operated a wizard motorbike. Investigators determined that two different people had worn the shoes and the second wearer's feet were too big for them. Within 800 feet of the shoes was a well-worn size 36 blue denim jacket with metallic buttons and bloodstains on the front, back, and sleeves. The jacket had some metal-based paint flecks on it and had been cut off at the bottom and roughly sewn, like, hemmed with a white string. There was a worn mark running the entire width of the jacket and under the armpits, possibly from a safety harness. There were bast fibers, like the kind used in scrubbing brushes, in the left-hand pocket. The blood on the jacket was Evelyn's type, and the blood smears found at the house she was taken from were made by cloth with the characteristics of denim. Authorities believed the jacket was worn by her kidnapper. I mean, if you're finding all this bloody clothing and it's her type, it's probably it. However, it appeared to be too small for a person big enough to wear size 11 shoes. One investigator concluded, based on the pattern of wear on the jacket and the way it was cut off, that whoever owned it was a steeplejack. Someone can have big feet and tiny body. I don't know. It's possible, dude. Just saying. Evelyn's kidnapping sparked one of the biggest searches in Wisconsin history. Among other extreme measures, investigators conducted mass searches of local vehicles and gave lie detector tests to almost all the students and teachers at her school. They took the shoes and jacket to 31 different communities and displayed them to an estimated 10,000 people, but no one recognized it. Many suspects were questioned over the years, but there was no evidence to implicate any of them. Some people suspect even Ed Gein may have killed Evelyn. He was visiting relatives in La Crosse, a few blocks from where Evelyn was babysitting. In 1957, police went to question Gein about the disappearance of a local barmaid and found, you know, human remains all over his house, you know. I, I did a video on Ed Gein. Watch that. <laughs> Ed Gein was declared insane and died in a mental institution in 1984. No trace of Evelyn was found on his property and he denied any involvement. Here is the base timeline of events. 6.20 p.m. Evelyn is picked up from her home by Professor Viggo Rasmussen. It's about 6.30. They arrive at the Rasmussen house. Evelyn is instructed on where things are, what time to feed the baby, 7 p.m., and when to put her to bed, 7.15. 6.45. Professor Rasmussen, his wife, and older daughter have leave to go to the game. It is believed by police that Evelyn was kidnapped between 7 and 7.30. At 7 p.m., a neighbor couple hear piercing screams, but don't call the police. Like dumbasses. 7.15, a man who lived down the street saw three people walking down the road, two men with a girl between them. A few minutes later, while heading to the game, he sees them again, this time speeding westward with one man driving and the other man in the back seat with a girl who was slumped over. 
8 p.m. Neighbors notice that an unfamiliar light colored car has been circling their hood, but no longer seen. 8.30, Evelyn was supposed to contact her parents, but didn't. 9.20, Evelyn's father leaves the Hartley home and leaves to go to the Rasmussen house. Around 9.30, he arrives at the Rasmussen home, sees the lights on, hears the radio, but no one answers the door. He investigates and finds a window screen missing in the basement. He enters the house and finds the baby in the crib, but no Evelyn. Around 9.40, a neighbor sees Dr. Hartley around his neighbor's house. He goes over to see what is going on, and after talking with Dr. Hartley, helps him circle the house looking for Evelyn. At 9.49, the neighbor returns to his home and phones the police. In 2004, a man named Mel Williams came forward with a conversation he recorded years earlier at a bar. Although his goal was to record a band which was performing, the conversation between two men was unintentionally recorded as well. On the tape, one of the men, Clyde Tiwi Peterson, implicated himself, Jack Galper, and one unnamed party in the disappearance, claiming that Evelyn was murdered and buried in Lafarge, Wisconsin, after her kidnapping. Gopar and the unknown party are now deceased. Although authorities promised to investigate the lead, nothing came of this. Here are theories. First theory is that she ran away, which is the dumbest theory I've heard all day. <laughs> she had no signs of running away, and there was no sign that she was being bullied. Some think she may have run away for a secret boyfriend, but anyone who knows her knows she didn't really like have an interest in boys. Like she went on a few dates with guys, but she never like had a serious boyfriend, and she wasn't the type of person who would just like hide a boyfriend. And if you look at the house, it's clearly obvious because when someone runs away, there's usually no struggle. They kind of just, they're gone. Sometimes there is, but usually they just, they leave. But there's blood and that means that she purposely cut herself to make it look like she was attacked and then ran off, which makes no sense for a 15 year old who's just babysitting a baby. Second theory is that her parents set her up like a drug deal gone wrong sort of thing. They didn't pay the Rasmussen's, so they got rid of her. That makes no sense either. There's no evidence of drugs or anything like that. Her parents were really worried. They came to her, like, when she didn't answer, they came to the house. They checked for her. Like, that doesn't make any sense either. Why would her parents do that? <sighs> Third theory is that she was or was not the intended target. Some believe that the men, or man, who uh, took and killed um, Evelyn was actually going for the original babysitter. Because she was supposed to be there that night, but, you know... Evelyn took her place. It's possible that they followed Evelyn to the house and then took her because they wanted her. Or it's also possible that they were going for the other babysitter, found Evelyn, and went, we'll take her instead. It's possible that they took her for sexual satisfaction, but of course, because we don't have a body, we have no idea if that's actually what they wanted or what happened. Also, there was nothing stolen from the house. Um, so if it was a robbery, they didn't take anything. It's possible they were going to rob and then they found her and their plans changed, but, uh, there was nothing stolen. So it was not a robbery either. <laughs> Sadly, there's one thing that we can agree on is that Evelyn is most likely 100% dead. Uh, she was most likely killed in an unknown area and buried somewhere. There's even a strong possibility that she died even before they could have done anything to her because of the amount of blood found at the Rasmussen's house. Which either means that she died from blood loss or died of complications due to her injuries while she was in the car with the people who took her. That leaves two options. Either she was murdered when the abductors were done with her or she died shortly after. However, judging by the tape the police found, the police... Judging by the tape that was given to the police in 2004, it doesn't really reveal much. All it says is that it was possibly that she was murdered and stabbed, which, with the blood, it's quite possible she was stabbed. Um, after, be But we, we don't know. So the big question is, where did they put Evelyn? Now, La Crosse is not a tiny place, but it's also not the most dry, and it's not like we're talking Madison or anything, but... La Crosse has a lot of different areas that she could have been taken to. She could have been buried in the major wooded areas. She could have been disposed of in a river She or in somebody's house. Anything is possible, but I'm going to go over a few that are good candidates. One of them is the Mississippi River. At first, you think the fact that her body in the Mississippi, you would have thought someone would have found her, you know, bodies have natural buoyancy, they're dead, they're gonna float. 
Not if someone tied something to her legs. If someone would have tied something heavy to her body, she could have sank to the bottom. In some areas of the Mississippi, it is very deep, so it's possible, especially in the 1950s, when they didn't really have sonar equipment, that they just dropped her at the bottom, and then that was it. The second area that she could be is the general area of where the clothes was found. All the bloody clothes was found near Highway 14. It's possible she was buried near or around that general area, especially because that highway goes toward Lafarge, which is where that audio said those two guys had killed her. Another is just burying her in a wooded area. La Crosse has a lot of woods, <laughs> and so that's possible they just took her out into the woods and buried her somewhere, which, because of how much uh, wooded areas there are, it would be quite a while, quite a long time for anyone to find anything. The last possibility is that she was buried in Lafarge, since in the audio, that's where they said they had killed her. One thing that is notable here is that Lafarge is located on a river called the Kickapoo River, which is possible they just dumped her in the river, or the surrounding wooded area, because anyone who knows Wisconsin knows that there's either, there's a lot of open space when it comes to farms, but there's also a lot of areas where there's just forests everywhere. <laughs> so it's possible that they went to Lafarge and did the same thing they might have done to the Mississippi River where they tied stuff to her and dropped her in. Or they buried her in the woods there. Or she's buried somewhere else entirely. <laughs> Public efforts have included the Charlie Project and the Saudi Daisy Roots Project. A reward fund established in the immediate aftermath of the event reached $6,600, which is about $63,000 today. Her parents moved to Portland, Oregon in the 1970s and both are deceased. Evelyn was 15 at the time of her disappearance. She was 5 foot 7 and 126 pounds. She was a Caucasian female with brown hair, blue eyes, and she wore glasses but did not have them on when she disappeared. She was wearing size 34 to 36 plain white broad cloth slip and shore blouse with pearl buttons and white bobby socks. To this day, no one knows where Evelyn Hartley went that October night, and to this day, the case remains unsolved. To conclude, I want to know who the killers are and where I can find them so I can punch them straight in the face. <laughs> Honestly, I'm pissed. Disappearance cases I find the most interesting because there's no evidence, like they just like vanished off the face of the earth, but then they also make me the most angry. Because it's like, I want to know what happened, but then I'm also intrigued because I don't know what happened. So, like, it's a back and forth thing with me. This case kind of just gets to me because, you know, Evelyn was 15 years old. She was a straight-A student. She was in the drama club. She was in choir at her church. Like, she was a really good kid. She wasn't, like, she, she was a good kid. And she just goes over to babysit for her father's friend and then gets murdered. Right? Like, what the hell? Baby's left alone, she's taken. Was it a robbery gone wrong? Were they going for her specifically? Was it just chance? I don't know. We will never know until we find her body and know exactly how she died. But by now, it's skeletal remains, so we probably will never figure that out anyway. And we probably won't know the true story unless we catch the guy. But because it's been so long, it's possible that whoever did this is dead. So we may never get an answer, which is... I think she's buried in a wooded area somewhere, and because of the blood left at the scene, I highly doubt she lived through the night. She may have died in the car, or she died when they arrived, or she died from injuries of blood loss, I don't know, but there was an 18 inch wide blood pool in the backyard. That's a lot. <laughs> like that's more than a foot wide. It's almost two feet wide blood. I don't know how deep, <laughs> but uh, that's a lot. And there was blood on the garage, and blood on the windowsill, and blood on the neighbor's house. Like, she was bleeding everywhere. It was type A. Of course, it could be one of the killer's bloods, but does that make sense? No, it doesn't. It was definitely Evelyn's. I wish they could be like, yeah, it's her blood. Yeah, it's 100%. Like, when they found the bloody clothes, they're like, yep, it's her. But back then, they could only really get the type. She was type A. The blood was type A, so it's probably her. Um, now, if they did it, maybe they'd find something. But this case isn't, like, a popular one where everyone's like, yeah, let's get the killer. Back then, it was, like, a big deal. Like, there were lie detector tests and people searched cars and, like, they did a lot to try and get this case solved. But now, 
I mean, that happened in 1953. It's 2021. Like, there, there's little chance this is going to get solved. I hope one day that someone takes the time and goes, I'm going to solve this case. And I hope they find her. I hope, because her family deserves closure. Her parents are dead. Her siblings, I don't know if all of them are dead, but they're getting up there in age. If she was alive today, she'd be in her 80s. And she was the youngest, so it's possible they're all dead, or close to being dead. So, the only people that would be left to mourn her would be her nieces and nephews, or other family members. Like, her main family is pretty much gone, and it sucks because they never got the answer to know what happened to their daughter. Which I think is the most heartbreaking, because you die knowing that you have no idea what happened to her. And that is sucky. <laughs> Honestly, horrible. I hope you guys enjoyed as much as you can enjoy a story like this. I'll be back again on Thursday with another True Crime Thursday, and Monday with whatever I decide to post. Alright guys, I'll see you later.